<laughs> Hi. Hi, everyone. So I, I'm Katie Angan, the program manager at the Architects Newspaper, and I want to welcome everyone to the next panel, Building Community Through Adaptive Reuse. Adaptive reuse is one of the most promising facets of contemporary practice, if not demonstrated by the engaging conversation we've had all day so far. And if the work of panelists Karin Liljegren of Am Givening and Juliana Wolf of Studio Gang is any indication. As the cost of vacancy rises, these leaders will discuss the challenges designers face when building community through adaptive reuse. Initiatives to reinvest in existing spaces at both the urban and campus scale will be explored with bold projects such as the Beloit College Powerhouse in Wisconsin and the Rendon and Sears Landmark Building in downtown Los Angeles. Karin Liljegren, FAIA, is the founder and principal of Am um, Giving, the downtown LA-based architecture and interiors firm that specializes in adaptive reuse. She's dedicated her career to revitalizing downtown LA with inspiration from the past, present, and future of underutilized urban places. In her advocacy work, Karin is highly active with city and county officials in crafting policies that ease the challenges of working on existing buildings. Juliana Wolf is a design principal and partner in Studio Gang Chicago office. Over the past 10 years, Juliana has led the design for several of the studio's most significant adaptive reuse projects, including the recently completed Beloit College Powerhouse and the rehabilitation of Reynolds Building in the new College of Design for the University of Kentucky. She's also the deputy lead designer for the O'Hare Global Terminal, the studio's largest project to date. Um, so with that, I'll let you guys take it away and Karin will start us off. Great. Hi. Well, thank you so much. This has been a, a really awesome um, summit to be a part of. It's really fun to see the interaction. And I'm also really appreciating um, the cross pollination of the preservation and the adaptive reuse. It's been really fun to have that dialogue. And since our, um, our talk is about community and adaptive reuse, I also want to address just this, this summit has definitely been um, our own little community. So, <laughs> so um, let's see, a, a little thing about us uh, in a little more detail. So we're very much um, in and about Los Angeles, at least for now, we're trying to expand out. Um, but we've touched about 400 buildings, mostly in and around downtown LA. So that's definitely our community and a wide range of project types, office, hospitality, multifamily. We do architecture and interiors, little tiny things like a 600 square foot local cafe to a 2 million square foot um, historic landmark adaptive reuse. So our approach is very macro to micro, which I think really ties into the ideas of community and how there's like these nesting scales of community. Um, and so on the macro side, I think at the, the largest end, we're really involved in policymaking with the city, um, modifying codes, um, having that kind of boots on the ground experience helps us kind of with, with that, but also coming up with ideas for developer incentives um, to, to make these projects viable. So, um, and then macro, certainly there's the city scale, there's the neighborhood scale, there's the, the building connection to the street, since most of our projects are a little bit more urban. Um, and then on the micro scale, it's, it's that human experience. Um, it's the way a space feels, which is, by the way, what I'm giving means in Swedish. That's a Swedish word for the way a space feels. And um, also on that micro scale, it's those little details of how we can connect to the past, which obviously everyone in this, this group um, understands uh, the importance of that. And so I'm going to start with the big, the big one, the two million square foot one. So this, there's a, I think there's nine distribution centers, here distribution centers in the United States, or I think some have been torn down now. Some have been uh, adaptively reused, some have not. Um, so we were tasked with turning this one into a thousand apartments, 200,000 square feet of office, uh, 60,000 square feet of retail food hall, and um, some site parks. And so some of the challenges is, this is just a massive 
box of a building, right? And so to put a thousand apartments in there. Also, if you think about um, a lot of these old buildings were single use, right? So the, it, it had, um, it was all Sears, obviously. They did have the store, but the majority of the building was distribution center, so warehouse. Um, and so now in the new use, we're carving it up into all of these smaller uses. Um, so how do you do that? And then also the floor plate, um, these are big, huge open floor plates. So obviously that in itself is a, a pretty big challenge. And then how do you create community? And this was a big, a big important part for this project because it's so huge and a little bit of an island just outside of downtown in much more of a warehouse district and um, uh, a let's just say a, a rich, uh, vibrant neighborhood um, and with a rich history in itself. So there was a lot of opposition to this project. They didn't want a big market rate project or whatever, but, but back to the ways to create community. So one way is um, culture, branding, identity, placemaking. And um, so this one, uh, it was gonna be to uh, coined uh, the mail order district. Um, which involved the adaptive reuse of this building as well as some new construction in the parking areas around it, but really tying it back to its original identity and kind of taking it further to the, to the future, of course. Um, and bringing in parks um, uh, and the site around, so you're actually pulling in people from the adjacent community or even as a destination place for other people in Los Angeles. Um, you know, putting obviously the, the retail and the food hall connecting to the park at the ground level where the loading docks were. And um, there were leftover train rails. Um, so kind of reusing those to create these, um, you know, the, again, the connection to the past. So the building was built in eight, nine, eight phases, starting from 1927 to the 1970s. And it, it kind of interesting that almost all of those other Sears distribution centers had a very similar pattern in terms of their development and how they expanded. So, and as you can see, the, the first, the, 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 the main iconic uh, front portion of the building that was built first, you can see where there would have been an exterior wall, which ties into the next slide, which is um, <clears throat> obviously a section and uh, as we needed to carve into the building vertically for the residential uses, one of the things we did was, um, so, so for example, the second light court to the left, um, we cut that light court where the existing exterior wall used to be um, so that you could kind of um, rehabilitate that old facade with new windows and, and then a new modern kind of light court around it. Um, the vertical carving also is really important in terms of, again, having, creating a sense of community. Because if you're just in this big box of a building and you have your little tiny unit somewhere, like you have no connection, you need to find a way as much as possible in every way to connect um, people with other people in the building. Um, so yes, there's, you see people across the courtyard, that's a pretty obvious thing, but also um, we have pedestrian walkways going through the courtyards. So, um, a physical connection, a, a, a visual connection, every way that we can do that possibly. Um, on the right, you see a typical floor plan, residential floor. So you can see uh, the, the big light courts that were cut. They're pretty massive. And by the way, this was a historic tax credit project and extremely difficult to get through, but we did manage to do it. Um, also, one of the things, and one of the briefs, because I know this, we were talking about this a lot in the last um, presentation, which was so great to, to dig into some of that, was, um, uh, you know, you're supposed to put atriums, not light courts. So we always, we do a lot of light courts because it's Southern California, right? So obviously you're not gonna have an atrium, especially if you're building residential. And that's always a big fight. And they at least have succumbed um, in all the times that we try to do it because, but we shouldn't even have to argue that. That's just, <laughs> um, on the left side, uh, that's uh, part of the ground floor. Uh, the back part on the left is where the food hall goes through. And so this is more about this horizontal carving through the building. Because um, again, you don't want to just have, originally the, the owner was thinking, oh, you know, bigger box or bigger stores. And, uh, you, you know, you come to the building kind of like Sears. It's, uh, but in order to create a community in this kind of experience and, um, and also to make it more affordable for smaller scale entrepreneurs or 
uh, food vendors or their first brick and mortar location. If you do a food hall, you can get those smaller scale, more local um, crafted and made um, uh, vendors turning into brick and mortar and um, creating this interior streets. So that's basically what I'm trying to talk about here is this interior street that we carved horizontally through the building so that you can engage with the building on the outside adjacent to the exterior spaces as well as on the inside. And so this is the kind of interior street um, going through the food hall. Um, and again, connecting the second floor as part food hall, part office, and then locating the skylight there, not just to get skylight into the food hall, but to connect to the resident, residential above. You, when you're walking through there, you look up, you understand that there's this, this whole other, you know, thing happening up there. So rooftops, those are a pretty obvious, um, great place to create community in existing buildings. They're almost always underutilized. Um, and this is the roof plan. And again, um, it's because this was a um, historic tax credit project. There were a lot of regulations. A lot of the boxes that you see were reuses of stairs um, or mechanical penthouses. So we did, we reused a lot of those. We, we did do a few small additions like um, the one here by the pool but it was set back enough so and pretty low down so you couldn't see it and met all the sightline regulations. So <clears throat> in terms of community, um, this, the, the left two thirds of the roof are um, all community spaces for residential only. So, and again, different scales of community, this created um, great gathering spaces for just the residential community within the larger community. And then on the right side, um, where the iconic tower is all the way to the right, um, that area was gonna be, it's a different level of roof and it would be more um, for event space. This shows kind of that side, a before and after. So it's also adjacent to a courtyard. And yeah. So uh, on a very different scale, this is a building on Broadway. Um, so Broadway in Los Angeles is our, um, it's the Broadway Theater and Entertainment District. It's the largest theater district in the United States, believe it or not. And um, we've been super involved, um, again, more on the macro side of trying to work on policy change for revitalization of this district. It's a really magical street. Um, and these buildings, it's kind of the last part of downtown LA to really get revitalized. Um, it's, yeah, it's still, it's very much moving forward, but it's, it's still, it's tough. So, um, so basically what we have done was, uh, let's see, also I keep thinking you guys are more national. So in the state of California, we have a historic building code. Uh, the historic building code is, is pretty vague and um, most of the local jurisdictions take very different interpretations of how to use it or how it can be used. So what we did through um, the guidance and pushing of the city council member and their staff was worked with the building and fire department um, to create interpretations based on that existing code specific to these building types in this district. Most of them were old big department stores without a lot of light and ventilation. A lot of them are high rise. They're all urban conditions. They're all property line to property line. So, you know, we were able to kind of work on that. Um, on the, this particular building on the more micro side, um, something I always thought was kind of fun was it was an E-shaped building, which is kind of rare for these buildings on Broadway. So it had two pretty good light courts. Uh, the original circulation on the left, uh, you can see were, uh, you know, historic tiled hallways to little tiny offices. And then we decided to put the, in the, in the change of use to residential, to put the circulation inside the light courts. And then the plan on the right, you can see um, by creating the circulation within the light court, uh, it really opens up the units and they're small. They're like 500 to 650, I think is probably like average size. Um, it allows light and ventilation on both sides. <clears throat> so that's kind of nice. But I think what's kind of cool is 
Um, the sense of community, again, that it creates in this kind of before after with the light courts. Um, I should have people in there like plants by their stoop or something. But, you know, these are essentially your uh, living room windows facing and then you have your entry uh, through the light court. Oh, and just again, rooftops. <laughs> I can't say that enough. And um, and then on the left, just kind of showing this was a, a pretty low budget um, market rate project, but um, uh, bringing a, that historic tile, which was the original circulation path, um, it was usually brought into all the units at the kitchen and or the bathroom, which was kind of nice. So the next thing I want to talk about um, are three buildings. I really want to talk about background buildings. Um, and it's been great. I think Deborah, you know, started, started to talk about this a bit and I've heard little bits and pieces, but it's, it's something that we're, we're finding more and more importance in uh, communicating and finding solutions for. So background buildings, you know, they're the ones that are, by the way, that was coined by the LA Conservancy. I want to give them credit for that term, which I think is a good one. Um, these are buildings that are not iconic. Um, they may not even be historic, but they do create the character of neighborhoods and communities. Um, and this audience knows there's nothing more imperative in our fight against climate change uh, than to reuse buildings, right? Um, reuse allows massive positive impact of offsetting carbon. Um, but in addition to that, reusing these background buildings retains the character of neighborhoods and, and allows communities to evolve without being erased. So um, this is the Rendon Hotel that we're doing, and this is the kind of um, existing condition and the proposed. So the idea, <clears throat> oh, the Rendon, so the, the original building was built in 1914. It was a hotel, it was a brothel, then it was an SRO. Currently it's being run by Art at the Rendon, which is an arts community organization that has ongoing series of creative programming, um, a uh, really amazing organization. And they wanna build a new hotel and they wanna expand their kind of interactive centric art, wait, interactive community art centric programming. Um, really amazing organization. So, and we were able to save the existing building, totally modify, you know, how it's gonna be used, but it's still a hotel. And then the new hotel component, there's a lot of, um, uh, gathering spaces, community spaces, blah, blah, blah. So this is in the arts district. And I almost wish I had a superimposed image that shows all the proposed development because um, this is a neighborhood that's currently in kind of a, a battle of low rise buildings being wiped out for new construction, big, massive new construction, which is awesome that this area is densifying, but it's not awesome that it's characters being erased. So there's this whole kind of battle happening. Um, and that's also the draw to this neighborhood is the character. So somehow we have to find solutions that we can keep the character and densify at the same time. And we can densify on top inside of a, a building or adjacent to it. And I think we just need to get a little bit more comfortable and inspire others of how we can do it. Um, this is another building I would probably consider background. This one and the next one are both on the same block in the fashion district of uh, downtown LA. And this was, uh, they're both just about done with construction. Um, and it's been a tough haul. Um, this one is a 1904, it's been a furniture store almost since its, uh, or since its origins, it's changed names a couple times. Um, so now it'll be office, restaurant, bar, retail. And um, the plan on the right, uh, so I, I just wanted to show the kind of nesting scales of community from the building to the block to the neighborhood. And so on the building side, um, we have an interior street that is uh, pulling you in. Actually, there's two interior streets, one that's the main one that's pulling you in um, to a courtyard in the back where there's a cafe bar. And then if you kind of plug that into the block, the same owner owns this other building that says food hall down here, which is the next building I'm going to show you. And they also own the land in between, which they'll be doing new construction, high rise, probably like a 20 story or so building. And it really allows this uh, awesome opportunity to create this paseo through um, as 
two partial alley, existing alleys, and then the middle portion to kind of connect it through. And, and also from a developer standpoint, it allows revenue to come from the backsides of buildings, which typically, you know, don't really create a lot of revenue. So, um, and certainly a great sense of community, a destination draw, all sorts of great things that this can do. And then the neighborhood plan on the left just shows how it connects to an adjacent existing Paseo on the next block. And that also, it really is a destination draw too. You can just picture people on Instagram. Oh, and then da-da, and you walk over here, look at this cool view. And, you know, I'm sitting here having my fancy latte or whatever. <laughs> um, this is the interior uh, street that draws you out to the courtyard in the back. Um, and just drawing on some really cool aspects of the building that you discover as you're, you know, removing plaster ceilings and such as these like beautiful arched, delicate joists. This is the back courtyard. Um, again, adaptive reuse anytime that, you know, you can find some underutilized, um, you know, kind of out of date uh, space. Obviously you don't need this kind of loading anymore. You're not a furniture store. Um, so it can really become a great little surprise as someone comes through this interior street and there's this little oasis. Um, and the other thing with community is obviously when, again, I'm speaking to the choir here with this group, but, uh, you know, tying to the past, all those cool, beautiful um, aspects of the old building, you know, the old steel doors and the archways and the joists and the brick and the, the weathered brick, um, all those things are so wonderful and really create community as well. Um, this is the other building on the, the same block that I was talking about. This is before, after, again, almost done with construction. So again, this is um, not a historic building. And um, so we were able to do a pretty big addition on the roof like that, which of course you wouldn't be able to do uh, if it was designated. But what I want to talk about here just for a second is developer incentives. So what we found, at least in Los Angeles, is that the cost of um, rehabilitating these buildings has doubled in the last 10 to 20 years. And that's that's a, it's really becoming problematic. Um, the, like, for example, this developer is like, I'm never going to do a building like this again. It's just way too expensive. Um, with our seismic retrofit requirements in California, with building and safety and fire regulations that keep almost exponentially <laughs> increasing. So we're working with um, the city, the Office of Historic Preservation, AIA, the council offices, other advocacy organizations to really come up with developer incentives. And um, we have an adaptive reuse ordinance in Los Angeles, um, but it's it's only in specific areas of the city. And so, and it's very outdated. So, um, uh, the, you know, the planning is trying to uh, evolve and expand this ordinance. Um, and I think also because of the newfound interest in existing buildings um, due to the climate change um, and also the pandemic and the need for housing, everyone's kind of turning and getting excited about existing buildings. They're like, okay, great, let's, <laughs> let's make it happen, but we gotta make it more affordable. So the specific things we're focusing on to make this happen with some of this policy is it has to be by right, no entitlements, because to wait two years as a, at a minimum in Los Angeles is what it takes is if you have to get, if you have to get entitlements to get rid of that, to, um, to be able to allow floor area. So, and, and to um, expand it to non-historic buildings. So say for example, a building like this, um, that those are some of the things that we're pushing for. And of course, we're still pushing for all this stuff with uh, hist historic buildings and, and making that easier and, and more incentivizing that development. Um, two quick things about community uh, back to this building is uh, ground floor street activation. Um, so this is just a simple architectural move of pull the storefront into the building. You get a great gathering space um, on the street, adjacent to the street. Um, I know with a lot of our historic um, projects that we can't do that and we can't even have openable windows or storefronts on the street, but anything we can do to activate that street, as we all know, um, urban streets are really in trouble right now. They're already 
having issues, especially downtown Los Angeles with retail vacancies. Um, but now with a lot of restaurants closing and empty, you know, we've got encampments all over the street. It's just, we need to activate these ground floor uh, retail spaces in any way we can do it. Um, and again, back to roof additions, a great way to, you know, really bring a sense of community. So again, you have the community of the building, you have the community of these smaller spaces, and then you also have, you know, kind of engaging with the larger community. And then um, just real quick, I wanted to talk about um, this last year. So we've done a lot of design charrettes and we turn them into reports. You know, that whole, like a lot of us have done that. Oh, what are we going to do next after, you know, after this pandemic? Um, so we did one about workplace, one about multifamily and one about urban reprogramming. And I just want to talk about one specific idea because I think it ties into the community aspect, which is, um, so for multifamily buildings, this is, uh, as an example, a building that is under construction we're, we're doing right now. And we kind of said, well, what would we do different? Um, you know, if, if we were starting today and we were able to make the decisions, right? Cause we're not always able to make all the decisions, but so, you know, typically, especially in urban areas, all the common, uh, the, co the residential common areas are, go on the roof and maybe there's like a, you know, a uh, co-working lounge or lounge or something uh, somewhere else. But two components that we wanted to kind of look at was this idea of a shared porch, um, which could be at intermediate floors, um, just a, a small area that, uh, well, I'll talk about it in a minute. And then um, the ground floor, bringing some of those residential common areas to the ground floor. Um, <clears throat> so on the roof, it, I think they had, part of coming out of the pandemic was the connection to nature. And that's like a whole nother presentation I could give, like just the connection to nature um, and how it needs to be in all aspects of our lives, blah, blah, blah. So uh, I think our recommendation for the roof is to really emphasize that connection to nature um, even much more than um, I think a lot of owners are realizing they need to do. Um, and then, but in terms of the community aspect, it's, you know, how to maybe program some of that space a little bit more. Uh, so for example, urban farming, especially again in Los Angeles, it works really well on a roof, even if it's a small area. Um, and then this kind of like catering kitchen lounge, you know, maybe there's cooking classes, maybe there's weekly shared cooking experiences, et cetera. The, so the shared porch idea, um, and again, this is an existing building, so we're actually removing uh, two windows, so it's an indoor-outdoor space. So it's covered, it's kind of like a patio porch, but it is open air and you can have lots of plants in there, et cetera. But if you think about dorm living, for example, when you were back in college, like the people that you knew on your floor, or maybe the floor above or something, you were much closer to those people, and then there was the sense of community of the building as a whole, and then the campus, you know, again, these nesting scales of community. So I think the idea of having these smaller little nuggets that someone could just get away from their partner for, you know, uh, an hour and go read or um, meet up with another friend for a cocktail at five kind of thing. And then the very last thing is um, bringing some of that residential common area to the ground floor and the idea here is um, if we're already feeling this underutilization of ground floor retail spaces and this need to activate them, um, why not bring some of the residential spaces to the ground floor? And then if you can also blend them with some of the needs in the say immediate neighborhood. Um, so for example, a co-working lounge, why not just make that lounge a little bit bigger and maybe have a little bit more operational structure to it that people in the neighborhood could use it as well as the residents. Um, things like that, but there's, there's a lot of ways that could go. Um, so yeah. And I guess I just want to kind of summarize and go back to the idea of these different scales of community, visual and physical, the connection to the past is really so important in these buildings and, and, and people want to feel connected to something. So I think adaptive reuse is perfect for creating community. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Thank you, Karin. Um, that was um, a great presentation. And I think that um, there are a lot of 
uh, parallels and similarities to our adaptive reuse work. So I will jump right in and um, try to, to talk about um, the similarities because I think that can make for an interesting follow-up discussion as well. So go ahead and share my screen here, which of course we just practiced, hold on. And now I can't see the application window. I don't know why. <laughs> Okay, well, I'm going to share, uh, I don't see my application window, but I'm just going to share my entire screen. So if I get some um, Teams pop-ups, just ignore them, please. <laughs> okay. All right, does that, uh, can everyone see that? I assume so, otherwise I think you will stop me. Um, all right, so I want to just give a quick introduction. Um, Juliana, sorry to interrupt, yep. go ahead. You might wanna hide the notification at the bottom there and you're good to go. Perfect, all right, <laughs> sounds good. So I'm Juliana Wolf, I'm um, representing Studio Gang and um, uh, first and foremost, of course, Jeannie Gang who founded Studio Gang, but also um, my 120 amazing uh, colleagues, which you see on the screen right here. Um, we have four offices. Um, the first one um, is the one um, in Chicago, which is our headquarters on the top left there. And um, since since um, starting that office, we also opened smaller um, offices in San Francisco, New York and Paris, which is uh, really related to the fact that we had worked there, but wanted to make sure that we are also local um, to, to the places we built in. Um, in Chicago, we are uh, took over a few years ago um, also a historic structure. It is um, a building from 1937, and it was the former Polish National Alliance building. Um, and, and I guess you could, it's a reuse uh, project, not adaptive reuse, I suppose, because it was, um, it, it definitely had office functions within it, but it became a really great um, kind of almost lab that we could um, test the way we want to work, but also um, looking at ways to um, contribute to um, the, the larger um, ecological context we are within. And Karen, you uh, pointed out the importance of the roof and um, opportunities to connection to nature, which um, certainly is something we strongly believe in as well. Um, kind of having this dream of these sky islands that eventually um, connect the rooftops um, within the city. But we started our own green rooftop kind of as a um, a, a sort of um, testing case just to see how much biodiversity can we um, create in this very small patch of green, but also wanting to use it as a community space. So this um, pavilion that you see right here um, was an addition. It was, um, it's a landmark building, so it's set back um, from the view from the street facade right here, but it allows us to have this community space that we have um, gatherings in and of course, we use it for our own meetings as well, but we have a lot of events there also. And we are using that space as well as the um, green roof kind of as a, as a um, teaching tool also uh, to, to bring community together. So we do this annual bio blitz where we invite the local schools to help us count um, the various species that can be found on the roof. And we have been um, able to continue to grow the total species count year after year to 208 right now. Um, I don't know, it sounds like a lot to me, but I'm <laughs> not a biologist. So um, I, I don't know what the limit is there, but um, certainly exciting to do that. Um, we work on many different typologies, um, uh, anything from kind of smaller community uh, structures and gathering spaces to uh, high rises. We work for um, uh, universities on academic buildings, but also cultural projects um, such as theater, museums, um, etc. And we also um, have an interiors practice. So we, um, whenever we can, also um, do our own interior work as well. And then we 
very much enjoy working on an even smaller scale on exhibitions, material explorations, where um, there has been a lot of interest too in uh, reuse on that scale. And and Karin, as, as you pointed out, it's kind of the the macro to micro, micro to macro that we are very interested in. And on the other side of the spectrum is the kind of um, urbanism and civic impact work. And I think it's really interesting to think about that scale also when talking about um, adaptive reuse, because there are um, there, there are um, neighborhoods, of course, that, that are filled with structures, as you were also pointing out, that um, are ripe for reuse. And um, if we can start to think of them as a kind of connected asset, then the potential of those can can um, be, be harnessed even more. And I, I quickly wanted to share with you one project that we worked on that is um, investigating this kind of community scale um, activation of an entire neighborhood, also harnessing its existing um, structures. And that is a neighborhood activation study we did for the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice in New York. And we focused on two neighborhoods, um, one in the Bronx, one in Brooklyn. Those neighborhoods were chosen together with the client um, because we felt and the client felt that there's a lot of potential uh, to to um, uh, to transform the neighborhoods. They they both have a high hardship end index and also a high, high crime rate. And the point here was to bring together all of the programs that the city is already um, uh, is already providing in these neighborhoods so so kind of community building but also public safety programs um, transit um, improvement programs and to tie it all together um, with a design lens to see how design thinking can assist um, these these existing um, uh, programs that were that are already underway and so, Within those two neighborhoods, we uh, started by by really looking what's there and what are the opportunities that can help to um, build community. And uh, again, the the overall goal was to build safer spaces and to reduce the crime rate. And so we looked at a lot of different metrics, um, such as density of youth, um, which community based organizations were in place already. Um, but also which kind of um, civic assets and structures were there that we could um, build upon um, in order to become the kind of hubs to to um, activate this, this um, network of community building. And uh, I think it comes without saying, but um, of course, with any project, but especially at the community scale, um, we certainly are... Um, not not the expert by any means and and need to um, really listen and learn from uh, members of the community but also um, specialists that um, understand the very complex dynamics um, of community um, in a much deeper way and so um, we did that and, and brought all that input together and came up um, with this wheel uh, on the right side, which which represents um, the six pedals that we again together <laughs> together with a bunch of experts um, uh, deemed to be necessary to create uh, or promote safe space, um, which are so the pedals are youth engagement, health and wellness, jobs and small business, green space, um, etc. And um, we felt that all of these together are required um, to really make a difference. And so that is kind of um, the, the, then we went into the, uh, into the community. And again, we had identified these kind of assets, which was the library, for example, or existing structures and looked for how they can be enhanced to, you know, to fill out the wheel of safe space, but also then to create connections between in order to uh, contribute to this this network, um, strengthening the community, and the outcome of that um, was a, I mean, the outcome in terms of our work, the design work. There's a lot of programming, um, city programming that is supporting all of this, but but our kind of design output was a series of um, these public spaces that we 
um, just visualized really what the transformation could be. And so this was, um, this is an example, um, Livonia Park, uh, which is an area the uh, uh, community had pointed us to. It's close to one of the um, uh, uh, train lines and uh, train stations, and it has the potential to be quite active, but currently is not. And so the proposal was to bring all the programs that exist already, artists and residents, um, um, as well as creating um, uh, kind of some, some business opportunities, allowing vendors to sell things, as well as on the left here, there's a climbing wall, which um, creating um, uh, creating controlled risk-taking opportunities was something that the city was really interested in. So that's all, all of that is bundled um, under this, um, under and around um, uh, this this uh, uh, train line in order to create this this hub of activation. Um, the library, just checking my time here real quick, see how long I'm talking. Okay, um, the library is another example where um, we it's it's going to remain a library. The building itself, and that's a project that's underway now. Um, actually, um, the the um, facade itself is going to be opened much more so that the activity on the inside can be seen on the outside. Um, the barriers around the library are being removed so that it actually can connect to the parks that are adjacent. Um, there's kind of a sports court and park adjacent anyway. And then additional program is going to be added to it uh, to further activate um, that hub, um, which in this case is a community kitchen. Um, the final example I want to share with you is this uh, Step Street, which is an, a, a really important pedestrian connection um, in the Bronx. There's due to the um, the various um, uh, level changes, there are a lot of these Step Streets, and that um, uh, that particular one is, is quite it's quite active, and it, it already has a green space next to it, but it didn't have all the pedals of the wheel filled out. So, for example, what was missing was again the opportunity for um, uh, to to have um, vendors and to have this this kind of the, uh, business aspect to it. So, so I guess a little bit more <laughs> the very I guess contemporary version of the uh, Rialto Bridge, maybe you could call it. Um, but but in any case, so it's lined uh, with these business opportunities. Um, so anyway. It, that for the discussion in terms of just rethinking uh, or of thinking further on the neighborhood scale, but I also wanted to then jump back to the building scale, um, which is, uh, to be honest, the, the kind of work I'm more deeply engaged in personally on a day-to-day -day level. Um, so this is a project in Beloit, the Beloit College Powerhouse, and we are um, we're really excited about this project because um, it was uh, the College of Beloit, and it was right adjacent, I'll show that to you in a second, purchased this a uh, formerly coal burning power plant um, for, I believe it was $1. So that was a great opportunity, but then um, hired us in order to transform this, what used to be um, coal burning to what used to be uh, coined as a uh, calorie burning um, facility. So it's a center for health and wellness. And just that transformation alone, I think it's, is what we are trying to do um, on a, you know, um, uh, much bigger scale within our cities. Um, but here, that one building documented that change, which really intrigued us. And so right in the center here is the location of the powerhouse. It is located um, along the Rock River. The city of Beloit, kind of the downtown is just south and the Beloit College is just to the right here up on a hill. And in order to really um, tie that powerhouse, not just to the Beloit College, but also to the community, um, it was, um, there, there are two um, kind of infrastructural um, things that happened. One, that we built a, a bridge across, and that's something that really came from the input of the students because that Pleasant Street, even though it's called Pleasant Street, it's not so pleasant. It's, it's very um, fast traffic. And since Beloit is on a hill, <clears throat> the Beloit College is on a hill, there was an opportunity just to 
build a bridge across for the students to have their kind of private access into the powerhouse. But then in addition, um, there was a there is a river walk that's currently being built, which is publicly accessible and creates an entry point into the powerhouse um, for the public. So the, the ground floor is uh, is used by by the community as well as um, below college students. And this is what um, the site looks like. So to the left here is the Beloit College. This is that bridge, the new bridge that goes across. And in terms of, so we we um, um, we worked on the interiors of these existing kind of three building blocks and then added this, this uh, fourth volume to the north here. And um, when working on these um, reuse projects, um, and Karen, you were mentioning that too, is, is really starting Starting with trying to understand their logic and um, their phasing, um, uh, the, the kind of um, uh, structural and architectural kind of volume logic um, that they that they followed um, throughout their kind of um, life. And so the beginning part of the Beloit powerhouse um, was this first kind of building right here adjacent to um, this hydroelectric dam. And then over the years, so that's from 1908, and then over the years, um, these additional volumes were added um, to increase the uh, power generation capacity. And so when we engaged the project, that's kind of was the northernmost volume and the kind of dashed line is where we added um, another volume to, which is this field house to the right here, which is um, used to for sports um, practice, um, uh, soccer and so on, but um, it's also used for um, farmers markets, graduation ceremonies, and it has this outdoor uh, recreation um, uh, park adjacent to it. And there are really huge doors right at the end of it, which open up to that park. And what was exciting is it's it's because of the doors and there's a lot of vents in the roof as well. It has really great um, natural ventilation. It's not really conditioned too much. And so um, the amount of fresh air that is um, being provided within this building actually qualified it to be deemed an exterior space, which meant even during COVID, um, there were a lot of activities that Beloit College could host within uh, this field house in a um, safer environment. And that's an image of um, what the field house looks like, uh, the kind of glowing volume um, to the right here. I'm just gonna check my time one more time. Uh, all right, still doing good, I hope. Um, and these are some images now from the interior. And um, what we were super excited about is, of course, um, a structure such as um, a, a power plant, this kind of infrastructural um, uh, structure has the, the opportunity to just, it, it, there's so much load carrying capacity already. So we felt like we were engaging a, gigantic jungle gym that was just inviting to be filled with activity. And um, we kind of took out a lot of the equipment for power uh, generation. We kept a lot, but there was also a lot that was um, just um, was polluted and had to come out. But then the structure was there in order to just receive um, that new new activity, which was mostly um, also fitness equipment and so on. And so that's another image. Uh, of the interior and we went through it with the students who identified the kind of elements they really wanted to keep. Um, so there's some of, of um, the equipment um, which is relating to the to the just operation uh, of the powerhouse, but also these gigantic coal hoppers were being uh, proposed to be used as climbing walls, etc. There's actually a bar, um, there's a conference room up, up above and a bar in one of these. So um, it's really fun to have these room size equipment that we could actually um, reuse as well. And this is an image that just shows all of the equipment, uh, oh, sorry, all of the activity that got inserted um, into this existing um, kind of uh, shell. So um, anything from a pool to conference center, lecture hall, um, kind of dining facility, and really exciting this this running track that ties all of it together, which was um, really exciting. So the college really wanted to make sure that um, there is that all the different activities are literally tied together because they have a bit of an issue where there, it's 
student groups are so siloed where the the um, athletics um, folks are kind of in their own world and and um, just all these different groups but but they really wanted this building to bring them all together um, so we we use the existing structure to again as I was mentioning to like hang a new program from to slide it in and so on but we also um, so somewhat surgically punctured through the existing building demising walls um, in order to create these view connections um, all throughout the building in order to tie the activity together. And that's a section that shows um, all, um, how, how it uh, ended up being implemented. So all the, of the activity within it and just some more photos. Um, so on the left, um, the existing building, and on the right, this kind of running track that is just um, hung from the gantry crane structure and is is um, kind of going through the uh, that turbine hall um, right there. Another image where uh, this kind of lounge space and uh, down at the lower level and um, athletic uh, floor at the upper level is kind of inserted into this um, jungle gym structure, you could call it. Uh, and another image that shows that. And then finally, just um, one more project, um, which is the University of Kentucky College of Design, where we um, just finished uh, construction documents. And um, this project is, um, so it's it's the various College of Design disciplines, um, uh, architecture, interiors, landscape, and so on, that currently are um, dispersed all over the campus and are coming together into this new building. Um, and and the, here it was um, about creating this, this community this uh, for the various de design disciplines um, within and outside of the building. So the existing uh, structure is, um, um, so the, the building was built as a um, tobacco uh, storage warehouse. And so we have this uh, historic structure and facade, um, a few really nice trees that we definitely want to take advantage of for outside program. There's a back porch, which is really facing the, the um, heart of the campus. So um, we wanted to activate that as well because a lot of students are coming from that direction. The intra inside is really interesting because um, the um, uh, tobacco that was stored and dried also within it is extremely heavy um, because it was wet. Um, and so the structure is very, very dense. It's this incredibly, it's almost a, like a forest of columns on um, the middle level, at least the upper level, of course, only has to support the roof. So it's much, uh, this is the upper level. So it's much, much lighter and thinner. Um, and some really unique spatial conditions within this existing building. So for example, there's kind of a, a jog within the roof plane um, right here, which is also shown in the photo here, and also a jog within the floor plane um, down here. So uh, the floor over here is actually um, kind of half a level up. And so we were really intrigued by what can we do to take advantage of this quite grand hall that is hidden deep within the building. And I guess, spoiler alert, I can say it, of course, it became the, the lecture the lecture hall. And um, on the left here became the stage. So we were able to use the uh, kind of floor stepping um, as a functional um, kind of programmatic element. And um, we were really intrigued also by um, the existing kind of detailing um, when the building was built, there was less reliance just on on um, structural shapes um, that were pre-made kind of from a catalog, but much more kind of assembled. Um, and and we wanted to pick up on that in the detailing of the new uh, of the new building elements that we inserted as well. And um, so, just like. Uh, Karen, you were talking about the mono use of the um, Sears project. Similarly, here there was a mono use for this uh, historic, uh, for, for the tobacco uh, warehouse. But here too, even though it's much smaller than the Sears building, there, there were all of these different disciplines that I mentioned already, but with all of the different spatial requirements that um, come with academic teaching. So studio space, lecture space, shop space, and so on. So how do you transform this um, mono-use um, kind of uh, um, shell to, to create this kind of polycultural environment um, on the interior? And uh, what, we, what we really did is was we, um, 
through a series of architectural interventions, like puncturing through the levels, adding um, uh, spaces that that um, create more um, kind of uh, places for gathering, um, the canopy on the outside, adding shade. So everything that is important for to for human comfort was kind of inserted in this more uh, industrial shell. And then the 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 program was located um, around these kind of interventions that all, of course, were governed by the, the found conditions. So kind of strengthening the found conditions. And just um, I'll just quickly go um, just a few more slides of how um, that is um, uh, working now as a building. So there is right at that level change right here, it's the main entry with uh, this stair, the central stair, which is um, puncturing through the levels and is, uh, all the community spaces are uh, located around the central stair. So it's a sort of gathering place. Um, again, the lecture halls um, and there's a cafe on the lower level. Um, the shop is right out here. Uh, and this canopy is another um, kind of Sorry, another uh, addition, um, which is which is creating um, this ex extending the use of the building out to the exterior. Uh, the landscape is a big portion of that as well. Currently, it's just an asphalt parking lot. So we were fortunately able to convince the uh, university to, that we could steal two rows of parking in order to create this outdoor space, which of course also helps with shading, etc. And this is a section through that level change that I was talking about earlier. So um, this lecture hall, which has two levels, the upper level can also be used as a crit space and so on. And uh, just a few more images. This one is um, of the lecture hall. Um, and a few more images of that central stair. Um, we were um, really interested in picking up um, kind of the detailing logic and structural logic of the existing buildings. So these kind of uh, wood columns right here um, with this kind of horizontal member distributing the loads, but, but doing it in a contemporary way and also one that recognizes that this is now for humans. So it's a much more, um, I guess, playful approach to um, structure and and also um, just just um, steel detailing because it is it is meant to bring people together and, and we were really interested in and therefore making it soft and giving it this kind of um, this this reading that is clearly going just beyond the pure um, kind of functional um, uh, logic the previous building uh, had and that's another uh, another view of the stair where you can also um, see the the kind of softer steel detailing. And then just the last slide, um, I wanted to show this is an image of the studios. And what's exciting um, the design now is actually taking the logic of detailing a step further. And they're building their own furniture, their own desks, um, 400 of them. They're starting uh, six months early before move-in and are uh, in order to get them all ready and are picking up the kind of steel detailing um, that, that, that we had put forward to, to um, bring it down yet to another uh, scale, the furniture scale. But it's all somehow following that logic of making that was put forth by the uh, industrial structure to begin with. So hope I didn't go too long. I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you both for such amazing presentations. I think everyone can agree <clears throat> those were very detailed. Um, and something you said to Juliana at the end about the structural logic reminds me of what Deborah said yesterday, which is that we don't in invent fake old or make fake old. So that was really cool to see happening on so many different scales. Um, Karen, too, you said that you know you touched briefly on the nesting of scales, and I think that's why a lot of these projects were so successful is that you're not just responding, you know, one specific history. Um, you're responding to the new community at so many different scales from the user to the city um, to the campus. So if you guys um, could actually touch on that and um, in your experiences designing for um, these scales, especially considering that a lot of your projects were both included a lot of public space too, not just private space. Um, I think that would be a great way to, to start the, the Q&A. Um, I'll 
um, oh, shoot. Designing for, yes, so so designing for um, just your, some insight into the design thinking for designing yeah. at these different scales, public versus private space. So, and <clears throat> my thought was a, a little bit going in a little bit of a different direction, but when you mm -hmm. start talking about the kind of interconnection, like interconnection is one mm -hmm. of our values or whatever. It's like one of the main things we think about because um, I think a lot of times I feel conflicted in the way I was trained as an architect in design school. You have one concept and it's almost like a big hammer that comes down. This is the concept. And the reality, I think, especially with existing buildings and communities and people and developers and codes and it's, it's not one thing. You can have an idea, a big idea, but it's all of those things kind of coming together, almost like you're throwing them all in a basket and, and out pops this thing. And um, all of those things have to be dealt with and thought of in a very detailed and thoughtful way for the outcome to be successful. And, and I think um, that doesn't always happen. So I would say that that's, that, that kind of interconnection um, to me, that's kind of how it works in my head or I think in our design approach. I think that's really interesting. I completely agree. Uh, we are going through with, with every uh, reuse project I'm working on, I'm going through that exact same moment where, because yes, it was an architecture school. We, we kind of were always seeking this concept, but we still practice and with new build projects that is just really necessary the way in, in our thinking at least because it, it really helps to set up this logic and framework that helps you make future decisions and so on so okay but i completely agree when you are talking about reuse projects it is not one concept that presents itself readily it's kind of this conglomeration of found conditions and that's truly what makes it so interesting so it's not even you don't even want any new concept that overrides it all but it's really somewhat opportunistic where you are where, where you're seeking you know we're just we always say start with what's there start with what's there like really uh Jeannie made us <laughs> go and spend i don't know three days in the building like drawing all the details at like really big scale and so and she's like no we really have to understand this in order to work with it and and in the end that's when it becomes exciting, but it, it does require a different kind of design thinking that I don't even think I can articulate yet, to be honest. Mm -hmm. I agree. And what do you what do you guys think are some of the biggest challenges to, um, I you know we have a lot of questions about um, extrapolating not just from the design team, but to the city and to other agencies. So um, why do you guys think this isn't something that's talked about more? And what are the biggest challenges to when approaching these kind of projects? Well, I started to talk about it mm -hmm. in mine, and I and I can give a whole just I've, I've given some a few presentations, but that's why I was really excited about the meet and greet that I was just in before this presentation is trying to join forces with other great architects and and um, folks in this industry to. Um, to help be a catalyst for change because it is getting so expensive to renovate these buildings. And I'm sure it's a lot worse in California than a lot of other places in the country, um, but it's just inherently very expensive. And it's it's gonna get, I don't know, we have to find a way to make it more incentivized, um, to make it easier, to make it faster um, so that it can happen more. Yeah. you. you yeah, I, I, you know, I, I have a lot of the, uh, all of the reuse projects I'm working on, um, the the client came uh, with that proposition already. And, and it was in all cases that in the case of University of Kentucky, it was a building that was adjacent to their campus and um, it, it just um, presented itself in a way for them to take over. Same with Beloit, of course. And then a few others um, where I'm thinking of, um, for example, it's a project I didn't talk about, the Arkansas Art Center, where mm -hmm. it, the existing buildings that were reused were already in their ownership. So there was about it, uh, about that there was a way forward. But those are singular kind of occurrences. And I think what why we are also passionate about um, reuse is 
partially because we enjoy it so much, but partially, of course, it's the um, the sustainability aspect and 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 the the dire situation we are in on our planet and having to do it <laughs> um, and in, in order to to take advantage of the embodied carbon, and 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 that means that it has to cross over to the developer scale. And I think, Karen, Karen, you have much. Uh, deeper experience in in that aspect of it, and I agree that it's important um, to to make that as easy as possible in order to continue that that um, what hopefully is a trend by now. Yeah, and I have some specific questions too about um, you know your projects that weren't coming from the client who was asking you to do these adaptive reuse ones where you were actually advocating for it. But Karen, we have we do have one uh, related to that. Barnaby Waters asks, how are you bringing together the city, AIA, um, SHPO, and councilmen to create developer incentives? And I figure we can just jump, since we're already talking about that, we can maybe speak to that. Um, I think it starts with us identifying where there's problems that need to mm -hmm. be solved or things that are cogs in the wheel. And, and, and then, then we figure out who's in charge of that cog, you know, is that is, is planning, is that a planning thing? Is that a building and safety thing? Mm -hmm. um, and then we figure out who has authority to help or force them to make change, you know, like, so city council has authority to push building and safety, right? So if we if we want change at building and safety and fire, we, we try talking to the supervisors and, and the various people there, but we really don't have a lot of impact. So we have to go to, who basically can tell them what to do. Um, and then we try to collaborate, you know, and then, and then of course, this has to be a, a friendly, you know, kind of thing. Um, AIA, our AIA is, is really engaged in advocacy with the city. So they've been great, but I think they have a lot of stuff on their plate. Um, but they're really wonderful at like setting us up with this organization or that group. And then there's another or a local organization called Cent Cent um Central City Association, which is an advocacy group, um, primarily for developers, um, but mm -hmm. it's, it, you know, so they they help kind of connect us. So whenever there's like a white paper being written or anything like that, we can kind of get involved. And now we've been kind of known as, you know, like adaptive reuse uh, folks in, in LA. So um, we're getting, they're coming to us more now for, for other things. So that's that's how it's working. No, no shipo though. No, nothing at the state or mm. federal level, which I'd love to kind of help um, do some change there too. Not yet. Yeah, you were um, in the previous meet and greet or already organizing some <laughs> like, how can with we, everyone else there. How can we do this? <laughs> yeah, I mean, do you, how important do you think it is for, you know, obviously everyone who's here is interested in adaptive reuse and is uh, practicing, but maybe it's not as widely talked about or accepted yet. How important do you think it is for architects to be pushing this kind of advocacy? And if we're not, you know, if architects aren't doing it, like who is doing it then? Um, well, I think we have to do it because we're right. the only one that really understand the implications of you write this code and it says this, but this is what it means in reality. Um, you know, and planners are so great at thinking on all these different levels, but they, they don't often see how what they're writing into the code uh, gets manifested. So like, we'll try to do case studies too. Like, okay, so you said this, and then we do these like really quick high level case studies. This is what it means. Um, so that they're understanding that. So any way that we can get involved, but it takes a lot of time and energy. Yeah. Okay. So I'll ask one more um, question about a specific project. Karen, you touched briefly on the background buildings of Los Angeles. Um, which might not be deemed as critical to the community from certain uh, parties or might be the first demolished for densification. Can you speak more about the background buildings and what opportunities they offer? And if you think that these are city specific to Los Angeles, and if not, like what other takeaways might be applicable across the country? So I think. Mm -hmm. Uh, so obviously I'm the most familiar with them here, but I think they exist everywhere. Um, and we know that we need to densify our, our world, right? Um, mm -hmm. So how can we densify and retain character of, of neighborhoods? I think that that's the thing I'm trying to figure out where, where that bridge is. So, you know, some, some buildings need to be torn down. Absolutely. Um, but there's a lot that we can build within or on top or adjacent to, and to, 
to start to have that conversation with with um, you know the community. The community is usually always on board for keeping a building. Um, and again, there are it's it's always case by case. There was a whole article the other day about trying to save some building just because some guy ate dinner there and it's really a piece of shit building. Um, and I, I don't, like we don't need to save every building, but again, if we tear them all down, <laughs> then we really lose our sense of place. So how, how can we do both? We need to start that conversation, have it more, have it with city people because they're not getting it. They're just thinking about writing code for new buildings, you know, mm -hmm. zero and all this stuff. Great. We've got to put all that attention there, but we also want to figure out how to write code for reusing buildings. And that leads into another question from David Marin, a little bit, um, you know, a, bit, a little bit of a harder question about gentrification and how you're achieving these projects without driving current residents out of their community. And I think you guys are really the perfect um, people to answer this one. It's a theme throughout the conference, but especially with, you know, Juliana with your work and some of the um, research that Studio Gang is doing as well. So one thing I can say is, um, all the adaptive reuse that I've done, I, no, I could probably say 95% <clears throat> that I've done in La, in downtown mm -hmm. Los Angeles. There was no one, there was no one either in the building being, it was not being used or it was severely underutilized. So, you know, there there is an argument to be made of if you're truly gentrifying, if you're not technically removing someone from that building. But then you could argue, well, but what about the community? The community is changing, blah, blah. In with working for private developers, it is very hard not to turn some of this into uh, what we all consider gentrification because the amount of money that they're buying the building for and that they're um, uh, renovating the building for, re rehabilitating the building for is so expensive. Um, they have to charge certain rents, blah, blah, blah. There are so many different ways to, I mean, the first, first thing is to recognize that that is the reality of the situation. And then what are all the things that we can do? Yes, we could have more regulation to require them to do affordable housing. Um, but that at some point, if you do too much of that regulation, then those developers leave. I, I have a lot of developers we're working for, they're mm -hmm. like, I'm done with California. I'm done with Los mm -hmm. Angeles. It's just ridiculous. How, but how, how can we do things to make it more affordable? Like I'm, I'm a huge proponent of micro lofts. Um, just, you know, if you're living in downtown LA, if you, you can have a tiny space that's really awesome and the same amazing residential amenities that other places have, but it makes it realistically affordable for working class or middle class. Um, and then subsidies. We need, we do need more subsidies. I mean, it's it's not a simple thing of just like, oh well, just don't make it for investors. Well, <laughs> then right. in a lot of ways, it's just not going to happen. Right. And I think you're the first in line, also, in, for some of these larger developers who are just trying to tear down um, without having these conversations about adaptive reuse or some right. of the amazing work that you're doing. Yeah, and I think it's, you know, it, it, it's, it's a very difficult uh, subject. And I agree that, mm -hmm. um, you know, regulation certainly plays its role, but maybe not over regulation. But nonetheless, investment um, in neighborhoods can also be a very positive thing, of course. And so when we come from the very opposite end of the spectrum, which is not, it's not at all about um, profit or working with developers, but working with the city, just trying to make neighborhoods safer and, and providing more amenities that, um, that is, you know, there is that investment is um, very, very important in order to provide um, quality to these neighborhoods that, that, that doesn't currently exist. And so, um, yeah, where exactly the that line is when when is there too much investment and when does the neighborhood change too much? I think it it's, depends. It's a case by case basis. But regardless, we shouldn't shy away from um, uh, from this opportunity for improvement. For sure, and especially.